The increasingly unpredictable outcome of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine raises the all-important question, what is it really all about? Let's find out. Joining us in Fredericton, New Brunswick via Skype, Mikhail Molchanov. He is Professor of Political Science at St. Thomas University. In London, Ontario via Skype, Marta Dichok. She is Professor of History and Political Science at Western University. And with us here in our studio, Janice Stein, TVO's Foreign Affairs Analyst and Director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at U of T. It's good to have you two on the line in Points Beyond. And Janice, lovely to see you again here in our studio. Let me set the stage for what's happened in the last 24 hours or so. They've had the referendum in Crimea. They got more than 97% of the people who voted. Obviously, lots didn't, but of those who voted to join Russia. Crimea has made the official application with the Russian parliament to join. NATO's foreign ministers have met. They're meeting in Brussels to discuss sanctions against Russia. Canada has announced some sanctions. The United States has announced some sanctions visa restrictions, asset restrictions. My question is, Janice, to you first, does anybody think any of this will make Putin reevaluate what he's done? You first. Very well phrased question, Steve, because no, I do not think any of this will make him reevaluate what he's already done in Crimea. But what's on everybody's mind is not what he has already done, but what he's likely to do next. Uh, is he, in fact, going to escalate this by uh, sending paramilitary forces sympathetic to Russia, let me put it that way, into other parts of eastern Ukraine? That's what's on the minds of all the prime ministers and the foreign ministers, and that's what the sanctions are designed to do, to send a message saying, stop, stop now. Mikhail Molchanov, do you agree that essentially Crimea is a done deal and this is more about the future than the past? Yes, I think so. It is hard to imagine that Putin would change his mind now when he basically has Crimea in his pocket. So the referendum is a done deal and whether or not we consider it legitimate, the important thing from the Kremlin perspective is that they do. Marta Dishok, I saw you shaking your head uh, at the last question. What do you think? Well. Nobody knows what will happen. What we have to work with is what we know about Putin and what we know about the international community. Putin is a 19th century imperialist in his thinking, and that's how he's behaving. The international community, we're in the 21st century, and there are instruments that the international community has to operate, limited as they are, but this sort of military incursion and forced referendum uh, I mean, they, they didn't do referendums in the 19th century. They just sort of walked in and took over. Uh, I think the response from the Western leaders is showing that they're very concerned about this. And it's just it's a matter of finding a way of resolving the crisis. I don't know that Putin will be afraid of what Obama or the others do, but he probably is very afraid of what his own oligarchs are going to do and what his own society is going to do. Well, you said Western governments have some instruments at their disposal, limited as they are, I think was the way you put it. Mm. If that's the case, it sounds like you're agreeing with what everybody else is saying because those instruments are limited and therefore not likely to make Vladimir Putin reevaluate what he's done. Fair to say? Well, what I was trying to get at is that economic sanctions will have an impact on Russia but they'll have an impact on Russia's corporate elites. They're not interested in breaking ties with their other partners in other countries. So if their assets are frozen, if the trading relations start to break down, standards of living decrease, then that leads to dissatisfaction and Putin will start facing a lot of domestic pressure. So those indirect kind of pressures, they're, they're not affecting Putin per se, but they're affecting his environment. So the, the inference seems to be, Janice, that the oligarchs will therefore put pressure on Putin to reverse course. Yeah. Do you see that? Well, that's the economic argument that's being made. Uh, and the argument really rests on uh, the fact that the Russian economy now depends on the export of oil and gas. And the big customers are in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe beyond. That's how, in fact, Putin has been able to increase standards of living. Uh, but that's a double-edged sword, first of all, Steve. The Germans, who have uh, the deepest economic relationship with Russia, are very concerned about moving sanctions any further out than they are now, because they're big companies, Siemens. Uh, there are 6,000 
German companies that have investments in Russia of one kind or another. So starting down this road hurts not only the Russian economy, but the German economy as well. Which means, by extension, the European economy. Which means, by extension, the European economy. So we all have to understand that these kinds of instruments are not targeted enough to hurt the Russians without hurting anybody else. The, the people who, in Russia, who are likely to dislike this the most are in fact the oligarchs who have multinational investments. But here's one useful reminder. The period of most intense economic interdependence before the recent round of globalization was 1914. And that was not a good year. And that was not a good year in mm -hmm. terms of its outcome. Right. So yes, economics matter, but they never trump national security issues. Mikhail Molchanov, let me put to you the news that has just emerged that Ukraine has announced the mobilization of 40,000 reservists into military duty. And I wonder, as you hear that news, what you think that portends? Well, I, have no, I hope it does not portend anything bad in terms of a hot confrontation and the war between Ukraine and Russia, because this would be a national disaster for Ukraine and for Russia, everyone uh, in the region. So, of course, Ukraine, uh, needs to take measures to protect its sovereignty. Uh, but with regard to Crimea, many newspapers, uh, news sites in Ukraine and analysts agree that it's basically uh, by one conclusion and Crimea is probably lost. And we should remember that in the case of Crimea, it's not uh, just the question of one country going to occupy another country. It's the question of a genuine Crimean separatism, which was breeding there and brooding for a while. And uh, as you could see on TV, nobody was forcing people in the voting booth uh, on the on the gunpoint. So they enthusiastically went there and voted for uh, reunification, as they put it, with Russia. So this complicates the whole story and makes it more difficult to find a solution to this crisis. Janice, Canada has been absolutely categorical in its position from the beginning on this. Do you worry that we're in a bit of a glass house here in that you've got one part of a larger country that wants to go off on its own and maybe there's more issues at play here than perhaps Absolutely. what appears to be on the surface? You know, it's quite interesting because usually the governments that are most reluctant to speak out on these kinds of issues are Spain, which has an issue at home, and Canada, which as we all know, uh, has an issue at home as well. With Quebec. With Quebec, obviously. But I think what, uh, and, and, and here's an important um, point to make, Steve. Uh, Crimea yeah, has been part of Russia for over 200 years, frankly. And yes, there is very, very strong identification with Russia by the majority of people who live in Crimea, although by no means all. So Putin didn't need to send paramilitary forces in first uh, to surround Ukrainian soldiers, to shut down any independent So why press. do you do that? Well, that's the thing that is bothering. Humiliate? The other. I think there's a visceral resort to force under these circumstances, a willingness to take no chance on the outcome of this. But that is what's bothering the G7 governments, that this was a gratuitous use of force and I think it's important to distinguish between the referendum, which might have happened if Russians had done nothing, frankly, and the way Putin has managed this. And that genuinely crosses a line as far as all the G7 governments are concerned. Marta, does it look to you as if humiliation was part of Putin's game plan here? Well, just to respond to two things that have been said, uh, Crimea is a, per, a peninsula that has had separatist sentiment. Uh, the latest opinion polls showed that 40% of Crimeans were actually interested in leaving Ukraine and joining something else. But that's 40%. These are public opinion polls that, that are done regularly. So the fact that there's just been this event, some people are calling it a referendum, and there's a 95, 97% support for, in the, for separating from Ukraine, I think that needs to be put in the context of how that vote was held. And in 1991, when the Soviet Union fell apart, Ukrainians voted. What do you want to do? Do you want to... And in Crimea, in 1991, 51% of the population voted to be in Ukraine. And separatist sentiments, as I said, they've been 
around 40 percent. So let's keep that statistic in mind. And the historic relationship between Crimea and Russia, very often in the news, they say uh, Khrushchev gave Crimea to Ukraine and it's always been historically Russian. But who are the indigenous people there? They're not the Russians. The Russians took over for Crimea through military invasion. Hmm. So now the same sort of thing is happening, you know, 300 years later again, and it's being narrated and framed in a very different way. But let's actually look at the facts and let's look at the Crimean Tatars, who are the indigenous population. What is their position on this? So it very much why, depends why, on when you start why, the clock on this story. It always does. Yeah. Why do you need to have somebody march in troops and say, okay, let's have a referendum and see if you want to come and join us? Nobody was preventing Crimea from leaving Ukraine ever. In fact, in 1994, there was a very strong separatist movement and there wasn't enough support within Crimea to leave at the time. So I think we really need to look at the chronology of events and what's actually happened. Because troops went into Crimea's parliament and the person who's now running Crimea's parliament represents a party that had 4% support in the last election. That's the pro-Russian party that was installed to run the government and organize this referendum. So you're, let's look at You're saying that person's illegitimate in, in essence. Well, he didn't win an election. His party got 4%. The gotcha. reason he's in Parliament right now is because troops came in with guns and said, now you're going to be running the place. Okay, Janice has a yeah, response. One more thing that I think is worthwhile putting on the table here when we think about the big picture. In 1994, um, the United States uh, and others signed what is called the Ukraine Agreement, and here was the deal. We will protect your territorial integrity if you give up nuclear weapons. They did and we didn't. They did and we are not. Mm -hmm. And that's not only a backward looking issue, Steve, that's clearly a forward looking issue. When you think about the parallel negotiations that the P plus five, the great powers plus Germany are conducting with Iran, it's very difficult to then say to the Iranians, you give up your weapons and we will guarantee your security. When in Europe's backyard, the same powers are about to break their work. They have broken their work. They have, yes. Mikhail, uh, this is from the New York Times this morning. There is a poet and film director, a 72-year-old man by the name of Yuri Yudmilov, who says, I'm Orthodox and Orthodoxy began in Crimea. Orthodox people must be reunited. Do you think those affinities are still strong enough to explain why what has transpired has transpired? I wouldn't invoke religion in this regard. Uh, well, first of all, there are many Ukrainian Orthodox Christians who are Ukrainian nationalists and uh, do not want to have uh, anything in common with Russia politically or economically. Secondly, as Martha already said, uh, Crimea has a strong Muslim population of Crimean Tatars and uh, Orthodox affinities. Uh, well, in Ukraine itself, there are two Orthodox churches. One is the uh, Orthodox Church of Kiev Patriarchate, and another is Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate. So even the Orthodox Church of Ukraine itself is split by political allegiances. Uh, but uh, I would uh, I would like to go back a little bit to historical statistics and uh, remind you that if you are looking back in history, in uh, May '91 referendum, 70 something percent of Ukrainians voted for continuation of the USSR and only a few months later they voted for its dissolution. So uh, situation changes on the ground very fast and I wouldn't dismiss the Crimean uh, uh, referendum as a non-event. Another thing is how definitive it is. According to the Ukrainian constitution, we could probably <clears throat> deem the results of this referendum as indicative of popular opinion but not clearly as a as a legislature that should be acted upon. Marta, do you want to comment on any of that? Well, um, public opinion polls are conducted regularly in Ukraine. So we have a pretty clear picture of what separatist attitudes are like in Ukraine, in Donetsk. There, there are people all over Ukraine who want to join Russia. And the national average is 12%. In Crimea, it's the highest. It's 40%. We're also seeing clashes along Ukraine's eastern border in Donetsk, in Kharkiv, and other cities because there are people who do want to join Russia. That's absolutely true. But the question is, what percentage? 
Well, let me follow up with this. That's really the issue because this latest referendum says 95 or 97 percent of the people in Crimea want to join Russia. And I think we really need to question that because where did that statistic come from? Well, everybody knows that statistic is a joke because people who were opposed didn't participate yeah, in the right. in the referendum. Yeah, and, and the bigger ahead, part sir. of this, first of all, people who were opposed didn't participate. But more to the point, Steve, that nobody anywhere in the international community outside of Russia would say that it's legitimate to hold a referendum yeah. when the when your military is on the ground. Well, not only that, a week after announcing it's going to exactly. happen. Exactly. Where's the campaign? So it's not the number that matters here, really. It's the process that led up to and the conditions under which this referendum is being held. But, Marta, let me do this follow-up here. It, you know, I, I appreciate that you don't like the facts on the ground. I do understand that. But it, it appears as if most of the world has turned the page. And I wonder whether Crimea is the price that Ukraine has to pay in order to do what it has tried to do for decade after decade after decade, and that is get out from away, away from the claws of the Russian bear. When you say turn the page, what do you mean? I mean, accept the facts on the ground as they are, which is Crimea is going to be part of Russia from this day forward. Well, I, I'm not certain that that's the case. I think if you take a historical perspective and you see what's been happening in Ukraine and Crimea over the past three, four months, over the past 20 years, who would have predicted the Soviet Union would fall apart? Who would have anticipated these Euromaidan protests? Who would have anticipated Putin marching his tanks into Crimea? None of this is predictable and none of it is irreversible. I think we should really, uh, well, I certainly don't make predictions. Janice, irreversible. I mean, in, in the long run, as Kane said, not. we're all dead. That's but right. before that, in the this, short run, in the short run, this this appears no, pretty irreversible. Uh, well, there's nobody that is talking about using any kind of force to reverse this decision. But let's just walk through a couple of issues, Steve. Uh, the the Crimean Peninsula is a peninsula. It's not territorially contiguous to Russia. <laughs> it needs to be supplied. It needs oil. It needs gas. It needs a, it needs Water. Yeah, water. How is that going to unfold over the next month? And that's why what is immediately on the table, what's preoccupying everybody, is what does Russia do with respect to supplying a peninsula, which is now voted uh, in, a, in a referendum that nobody thinks is legitimate, to join Russia? Uh, that's where the real danger is. So you're right that everybody's accepted this for now, but they've accepted it for now because they are so concerned about the next steps. Uh, and that's what's preoccupying Ottawa, that's what's preoccupying Washington, and that's why the G7 is meeting. Mikhail, the one thing I, I still can't quite get my head around, and I'm hoping you've got a, an explanation for us tonight, the part of Ukraine that Russia has just announced it's going to annex Crimea. Crimea, which is overwhelmingly ethnically Russian. That's the part of Ukraine that has given Ukraine its eastern looking uh, anti-EU leadership over the last several years. I mean, we, you got Yanukovych in Ukraine because all those Russians were voting for him. Now you take that chunk out of Ukraine, aren't you in effect by doing that delivering Ukraine the rest of Ukraine, the non-Crimean part of Ukraine, to the West. No. How does that help Russia? <laughs> I think it's a good point, Steve, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, with the loss of, uh, of Crimean territory, as painful as it may sound, uh, the political nation of Ukraine may get more stable as a result, precisely for the reasons that you indicated. But uh, if I may take an issue with one point you raised, I don't think that uh, people in Maidan and uh, uh, people in Ukraine, generally speaking, were trying for 20-something years to free themselves from the claws of Russian bear. The, what they were trying to do is to free themselves from corrupt oligarchy of their own. Fair point. That was animated Maidan, and that's what animated protests all over Ukraine. Actually, Crimea separation also, in a way, is a result of inept government in Kiev, of the chaos and collapse of authority in Kiev. And people in Crimea, as those pollsters tell us, in many respects are looking forward to economic stability as part of the Russian Federation. You know, see, in, in terms of the future of Ukraine, um, Crimea is a small part of eastern Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And eastern Ukraine has many, many, many 
um, ethnic Russians that are dispersed throughout the territory. So the division that's been true of modern Ukraine and only modern Ukraine between the so-called Westernizers who look to the West and those who look to the east, to Russia, is still there on the ground in the division between East Ukraine and West Ukraine. The lopping off of Crimea doesn't solve that problem one bit. That's uh, before us. As long as we're on this subject of where that fault line lies, we have a good quote here that we want to read from Samuel Huntington, whose clash of civilizations uh, is now, I guess what? Absolute nonsense. When I know you to think this. that, but hang on, hang on. I'm, before you completely dismiss it out of hand, let me read it, and then you can completely dismiss it out of hand. But here he is from his 1993 paper, Clash of Civilizations. The fault lines between civilizations are replacing the political and ideological boundaries of the Cold War as the flashpoints for crisis and bloodshed. As the ideological division of Europe has disappeared, the cultural division of Europe between Western Christianity on the one hand and Orthodox Christianity and Islam on the other has reemerged. The most significant dividing line in Europe may well be the eastern boundary of Western Christianity in the year 1500. This line runs along what are now the boundaries between Finland and Russia and between the Baltic states and Russia, cuts through Belarus and Ukraine, separating the more Catholic Western Ukraine from Orthodox Eastern Ukraine. Okay. Okay, I, I, I... Ready, aim, fire. Ready, aim, fire. I haven't changed my mind one bit. We, what, what's wrong with that picture of the world is that the divisions within these societies are as great as the divisions between them. So in Russia, we haven't talked a lot about this right now. Uh, Putin um, right now speaks for one tendency in Russia, which is an old Slavophile view uh, of the West as a deep threat to the integrity of Russia. But, he, but that's not the only tendency in Russia, and depending on with the period you look at, there are Westernizers. Catherine the Great was the great Westernizer that we all know, who argues that the future of Russia is deeply tied to the West. So what Sam Huntington missed in that stereotypical classification was that we need to look inside these societies. Right now in Russia, there is a tug of war going on among the people around Putin. And from everything we know, see what's, what's alarming is in a sense, is the Slavophiles are, are gaining as this conflict develops and the Westernizers are receding. But that is for this moment now in history. Five years from now, we could be in a very different position just like we were five years ago. Mikhail, what do you think of the Huntington argument and the fault line that may or may not be playing itself out these days in the news? I like Huntington's argument, and uh, I understand that sometimes it's presented in oversimplistic ways, uh, sort of uh, either or and uh, no hues, uh, no gray between black and white. But the point remains that he called Ukraine a torn country a while ago, and it appears it, indeed it is torn between two personalities, the Eastern personality and the Western Western part of it. It's not just orthodoxy, though, versus uh, Catholicism. It's, of course, the history of being part of Russia for Eastern Ukraine for several centuries, being part of Poland and uh, Habsburg Empire for Western Ukraine for several centuries. So all of these, uh, of course, adds to cultural divide which separates uh, the left bank Ukraine from the right bank Ukraine. Marta, do you think we're seeing the Huntington fault lines play out in the news these days? Well, I'm just amazed at how Huntington keeps coming up. It's a very appealing scheme. I'm with Janet on this one. Uh, it, it's a nice way of thinking about the world, but it's actually not reflective of what, what's really going on. At moments, it seems like, oh yeah, this explains things. But in reality, there's so much diversity within these societies. And Ukrainians are often described as divided between East and West and pro-Russian and, and pro-Western. And that's not untrue, but that's just one dimension of the picture. And if we turn back to what's been happening over the past four months with the protests, that's often how they were portrayed. But in fact, there are people from all different parts of Ukraine that participated, and in all cities there were protests. Yes, they were stronger in the western part, but uh, there were Euromaidan in Kharkiv the whole time. And I don't know that the differences between the Orthodox, I mean, there are Ukrainian Orthodox and there are Russian, as Mikhail pointed out. 
So orthodoxy, religion, geography, there, there's also historical culture. I mean, Ukrainians living in central Ukraine, nobody talks about them. They have the, the tradition of the Cossack era and deep-rooted democracy and independence, and these people are pretty close to the Russian border. So I think the picture is much more complicated. You know what? One Western thing that Sam Huntington doesn't talk about, which is a big part of the story, is failed institutions. Um, and the history of Ukraine in the last 15 years has not been, in fact, a, a very good story. Uh, there is kleptocracy. Yeah, there rampant is rampant corruption. Yeah, rampant corruption to the point where Transparency International, you know, singles out Ukraine, uh, oligarchs that are in control of the economy. Uh, one of the predictors of failed societies is not a clash of civilization, but bad institutions. Um, we know more and more that that's a much more powerful thing to look at. And so when you look at the future of Ukraine now, right now, whether it's Western Ukraine or Eastern Ukraine, or how the two come together, Steve, if they're not able to do something about building better institutions than they've done in the last 15 years, the future is not bright. Hmm. Let's change That's our the big difference between Poland and Ukraine. Sure. What does Poland look like Poland today? Poland's got it right. Yeah. Let's change our, our focus somewhat to the Russian identity right now. And to that end, a couple of weeks ago on this program, we had, as a guest, the great-granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev, right. who, of course, gifted Crimea to Ukraine back in the 1950s. And we talked to her, uh, Nina Khrushchev, about Russian identity. Let's watch. Roll tape, please. A lot of Russian identity is defined by the idea. It is defined by the state. For Russians, very throughout history, the state is more important than the individual being. And therefore, of course, there is consumerism and individualism, but state often takes all. So even if the Russians themselves do not want to feel this way, the great Russia is important to Russians, to many Russians, to most Russians, regardless of what uh, ethnicity they represent. And I think that is that makes Russia a very difficult country to tackle and a very big problem for Russia to move forward because uh, in some ways um, the state somewhat changes, but society changes very little. Let's pick up, uh, Mikhail, to you first on this notion, as uh, Nina put it, the state is more important than the individual. And I wonder to what extent you think Vladimir Putin is the personification of this type of relationship. Yes, it is missing. No, unfortunately, I think we're having a little Skype trouble right there. We'll reestablish that. In the meantime, Marta, why don't you try that? Uh, this notion that Putin may be the personification today of this, the state is more important than the individual. Well, that's a tough question. Um, I was just reading a public opinion poll and the statistics on Putin are, are all over the map. On the one hand, people like what he's doing. On the other hand, people aren't prepared to vote for him again. And the statistics here were 32% uh, of Russians would be prepared to vote for Putin now if there was an election. And yet 72% support his policies. Hmm. I don't know how to read that. Um, and similar statistics on his latest actions towards the, the military incursion into Ukraine that 83% of the population is terrified of war and against war, and yet 58% support what he's doing. So how can you support a military invasion and oppose war? How can you support a president but not be prepared to vote for him? It's hard to know what... The idea of Russia is also a very, very diverse one, because as Janet was saying about Ukraine being diverse, Russia is huge, and it's not all ethnic Russians. So we have a core of ethnic Russians, but there are all sorts of people living all through the Russian Federation who are not Russian. And they don't necessarily buy into some historical myth that was constructed. Some of them do, some of them don't. I think the real issues are how Russia sees itself today and in the future. And what Putin's been doing is drawing on the Soviet past and you know, some, somewhat the imperial past to try to recreate Russia's uh, self-respect in the world, um, and perhaps this military incursion is his vision of sort of 19th century, this is how you become powerful. 
um, I don't know that it's it's going to resonate with society. There have been protests in various cities. Moscow had a large anti-war protest just last a couple of days ago. Um, I think the Russian idea, and this is something Janet has already mentioned earlier. There's always been discussion. You know, is Russia Western-looking or sort of Slavic? Mm -hmm. And that tension between Westernizers and traditionalists, we saw that throughout history, and we saw it when the Soviet Union was falling apart. I mean, Russia's first foreign minister, Kozlov, was very pro-European. He was taking Russia into Europe. And now, was that out Lavrov, he's quite different. Do so, those polling numbers make any sense to you, well, James? Well, they do in this sense. Um, they do in this sense that Crimea is a winning issue for Putin, right? And we know all over the world um, that when crises break out and there's an appeal to national sentiment uh, and to national identity, people rally around the flag, and you're getting that. Uh, kind of effect for Putin right now. But there's a larger picture here, and that's why I say Crimea is, it, it is the story today, Steve, but it's not really the story. If, in fact, this begins a spiraling process of economic sanctions, and they start to bite, uh, and, uh, you know, the standard of living starts to drop, the Russian stock market. Somebody put it to me today, the Russian stock market is our best friend. <laughs> Russia was for so long a closed economy, it's now longer, an, it's now an open economy. Uh, once those kinds of factors begin to come into play, that rally round the flag notion that happens in every society begins to diminish. It's got shelf life, doesn't it? It's got a shelf life, Shorter. and we know that from our own society yeah. that that has a, and it's 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 actually quite short. To me, the real question is: um, Are we seeing in Putin right now somebody who's deeply disappointed? in the support he's received from the West, who feels betrayed by what the United States did on Libya, who feels besieged almost, and is he surrounding himself, and it appears that he is, at least for the moment, uh, with a national security group who are deeply, deeply hostile to the West and reinforcing those very traditional tendencies in Russia. This is, an, as I've said, this is an old Russian story. If you read the history of the Tsars, they went back and forth between the Westernizers and the anti-Westernizers. And we're seeing this playing out right now in Russia, except with one big difference. It really matters to us as well as to Russia, mm -hmm. which way they resolve this. Indeed. Uh, with just a few minutes to go, let me put one more question on the table. And Mikhail, I'll go to you first on this one. Uh, which, which of the following two sentences gets closer to the truth in your view? Ukrainians want to join the European Union because they want Western democracy, or Ukrainians want to join the European Union because they feel their brand of nationalism can best be protected under an EU umbrella. What was the first one again? You were cutting off. The first, first. one was they they want Western style democracy. I believe most of Ukrainians want Western style democracy and also opportunities it gives uh, for economic advancement. That would be a correct answer. And an end to corruption. And to if you actually yes. ask what's the most important thing on the Ukrainian agenda right now in Western Ukraine, mm -hmm. it's to end the kleptocracy and the corruption. Never mind democracy. Never, never mind, mind all democracy. This other That's, That's right. Those are side issues That's right. for the moment. That's they right. want You're a just clean government. rage about the level of corruption. Hmm. And that's nationwide. That's not just in Western Ukraine. That's right. That's in that's Crimea right. as well? Sometimes people frame the people who wanted to join the European Union, they're Western, and they just... But this anti-corruption, that unites everybody. That's the same, and that's why, again, back to Crimea, that wasn't done in a fair way. So I don't know how people in Crimea actually feel about what happened. Some of them obviously are, we see the images of them rejoicing, but is that the majority? And this anti-corruption and, and use of force, this is something that, if, again, if you look at public opinion polls, that's what unites Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Marta, I appreciate that it's, that the, the, I want to take the corruption issue and just move it aside, only for the reason that uh, every Monday here on the agenda we're talking about democracy and various different questions about democracy around the world, so I do want to focus on that in our last minute here. And that is, 
do you think Ukrainians are more interested in having Western style democracy for themselves or do they want to be Western tilting in order to protect their own form of nationalism? What do you think? I think most Ukrainians want their own kind of democracy and they want the freedom. Democracy gives one the choice. They want the choice to live on good terms with both the EU and Russia. So that's how I would frame what I'm hearing coming out of Ukraine. Janice, last 30 to you. It's not about democracy as we understand it, Steve. It's about better, fairer institutions and economic opportunity. Um, we tend to think the whole world wants to look like us. They it don't. actually doesn't. It wants to look like itself. Understood. Uh, my thanks to the three of you for joining us on TVO tonight. In Fredericton, New Brunswick, Mikhail Mokchanov, Professor of Political Science at St. Thomas University in London, Ontario, via Skype. Marta Ditschok, the Professor of History and Poli Sci at Western University. And, of course, here in our studio, Janice Stein from the Monk School at U of T. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.